Y'all, welcome back to Kentucky Fried Wargaming, where two guys who aren't qualified to talk about anything decide to talk about a game with hard math and chance. I'm Joe. And I'm John. In this episode, we're coming back with a topic that has been on my mind since, well, since the update that I got to play 40k for the first time in a year. Um, and it's, man, it's something that I did not expect that we would have to make a whole episode about. Uh, but I kind of stumbled into something, John. I, I think my brain is on to some sort of logic. And I'm hoping that other people out there also share this difficulty. Um, in this episode, we are going to talk about the difficulty inherent in learning a new edition of a game that you've already been playing for a while. And why, at least for me, it felt really difficult. Yeah, it's it's definitely something you have to like adjust to, and it's harder than just learning a game for the first time. Like, there's there's a lot to that specific topic. Yeah, which I really didn't expect, but I had some difficulties that I will talk about in specific in a little while. Uh, but I figured it was worth us diving into it to maybe see if everybody, if other people out there share this, or if everybody feels this, or if it's you know if it's just me. But first, on to hobby progress and games played. Um, so, unfortunately, I have not played another game since uh, the last update. Uh, I went a full year between playing games last time. I'm hoping to make it a little shorter this time, but it looks like it's at least at a week in counting that I haven't played. Um, John, I think you're in the same boat. Yeah, I have not been playing. And I haven't even gotten Joe to pull him in to do some tabletop simulator. We've been both busy, so we haven't gotten to play any games. Yeah, it's been rough. Um, however, hobby time, hopefully a little better. John, what have you been up to? So I touched up my Helldrake a little bit in preparation for the oncoming Chaos because Bellicor's getting a new model. And even though we haven't got any codex announced for Chaos, I'm going to get myself ready. Oh my god. Can we just say, like, that Bellicor model? 10 out of 10. 11 yeah. out of 10. Yeah. Yeah. My Devil Daddy. Good god gonna buy him like he's great like i want him <laughs> like <laughs> yeah so like i was like in bed uh one morning and that release popped up while i was laying in bed with my lady and like i scrolled to the picture and just off my shoulder i hear her go daddy like, stop it <laughs> <laughs> but she's not wrong which is the worst part <laughs> Like, yeah, he's great. He's got huge wings. And you know what they say about dudes with huge wings? They can fly long distances. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And then past that, I've just been like reading a bunch of books on 40K. I've been reading Wikipedia articles, doing all the, the normal stuff I do, or I the requisite like 20 hours of both audio and of audio content a week while at work about 40k yeah um lord knows that's how i learned most of everything i know about age of sigmar and 40k is just listening to stuff in the background while i'm at work and i i, I hazard a guess that that's probably how a lot of people also consume the podcast so for those of you out there listening to a podcast on company dime good for you we yeah. support this yeah, boss makes a dollar, you make a dime. That's why you listen to our podcast on company time. Hey-o! You know? um, yeah, I, I feel that. For me, I have... Uh, well, I posted it up on Instagram. So I played the game. Like I did like a marathon hobby session before the actual game day to try to get as much painted up in at least the green scheme as I could. And I got a lot painted, but it was such a marathon session that after I played the game, I went, okay... You need a little break. You've done a whole lot back to back to back. I'm going to give you a little bit of time off. And I went back to hobbying this week, uh, refreshed and invigorated, and especially after playing the game, um, really ready to kind of like keep working on the salamanders. So if you guys want to actually see what I've been working on, I posted it up on the Instagram. Um, but I took everything through all of the airbrush green colors. Uh, for my salamander scheme, I'm not much for sort of the heavy metal style of painting that GW does, where it's sort of like a an all-over base color, 
and then a bunch of Ed's highlights. Like that's just that's not my it's, shtiz. It, it's too much work too. Like for for a whole army, that's too much. Yeah, just in my opinion, I think it's a whole lot of work to not get a ton of contrast, especially at three feet away. I think it photographs well, but on a table from like three feet away, I don't see Edge highlights on models. And maybe it's that's also, just because I need glasses and I haven't had them in my entire life, but I just, it doesn't pop, you know? I mean, I'm, I also need new glasses because I haven't gotten new glasses in six years, so I feel that. But also, heavy metal painting and, like, the box art painting looks that way because they have people whose whole job is to work 40 hours a week painting these miniatures. Yeah. So they, they can afford to spend all that time on, like, a single Chaos Space Marine or, like, a single aggressor. They, you can't as somebody who has a full-time job and does other stuff besides just paints miniatures. I think you probably could, but man, you would, you'd be struggling. So for you'd me... You'd never get an army done. Like, you'd never be able to play with a fully painted army. Yeah, it's going to be a while. Uh, for me, I find I get a whole lot more bang for my buck, sort of metaphorically speaking, and doing uh, high contrast uh, airbrush schemes using the idea of Zenithal lighting to really punch the contrast between the shadows and the light side. So um, everything I paint, I first coat it in a dark green from Games Workshop. I think it's Caliban green. So everything gets primed gray and then everything gets an all over color of that Caliban green. And then I come over just from the top with a like mid-tone green. And then once I get over the top with the mid-tone green, I come back with a really, 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 really light green. That's almost yellow and just hit the tops of things uh, to make it pop like the lights hitting it from above. And one, way faster, especially with an airbrush, incredibly quick by comparison. It's still time consuming, but it's not so bad. Um, and second, it gives me much better contrast on a table. Uh, Doug from 2 Plus Tough has the concept of look at three foot gorgeous, and that's where I live. That's. That's where oh, I oh, operate. Yeah. Oh yeah, you you get too close to my models. It's just like getting too close to me. You're just gonna be like, ah, ooh, can you like step further back? You're looked way better from like <laughs> six feet away. You're all right <laughs> from fifty feet. Like maybe go back there. Um, and like even at three feet away, I look at these models and go, man, like that's a cool color gradient. So when I do that, though, as many airbrush painters, I'm sure have felt, I have a tendency to mix more paint than I need in my cup when I'm just doing like three models. So instead I bust a bunch of them out and I just knock through them all at once. So I didn't quite get all the way through all the models before the game. So this week I pulled them all out and I got them all up to step two. And then I came back in with that light, 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 light green and hit them all from the above with these sort of targeted highlights. And now that that's done, like the Redemptor Dreadnought, my custom Kitbash Captain, my Librarian, uh, my Apothecary, that's what they call a Field Medic, and then my Aggressors, uh, now all look airbrushed out. They're looking great. And I'm ready to kind of put the airbrush away and pull out the, the good old-fashioned paintbrush and start working on them. Um, and to be honest... I'm kind of torn between painting the Aggressors first or painting the Redemptor Dreadnought first because I love them both so much and they did so much work for me on the tabletop. Um, I'm sure I'll pick one or the other and just kind of dive in on it. Um, or you can yeah. have the listeners pick for you. We just have them bully you into painting a specific thing. <laughs> well, this won't go live for a week. So... Uh, I'm probably going to pick before they get a chance to weigh in. <laughs> oh, that's, that's fair. That's fair. But they should still bully you into painting other things. They should also probably bully me into finally biting the bullet and getting an airbrush. But I mean, I'm here for that. Although, John, you can't have the bully too. I thought they were supposed to bully me into make a knight's army. <sighs> Listen, I just want them to bully you. Like, they just got to find something to bully you about. <laughs> Damn it, John. Bullying's not okay. <laughs> Internet yeah. bullying's a crime. It's 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 only okay when it's in good fun. <laughs> <laughs> Peer pressure's bad, kids. Unless yeah. it makes you paint models. Yeah. Then it's great. Now it's yeah. community inclusion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, if people do have an idea of what they want me to paint next, I'm down. Um, 
I have a feeling I'm going to paint these salamanders for a little while, and then eventually I'm going to be like, yeah, I'm done painting guns and power armor, and then I'll probably go back to Gloom Spike Gits and paint a little bit of goblins. Or they'll release a Tyranids Codex, and you'll be like, I'm going to paint bugs. Oh, but if they give me a good one, I will paint bugs. Uh, actually, yeah. Vince Ventrella did a hobby cheating episode on YouTube on like a very, very cool Tyranids paint scheme. That is sort of a, a speed painting scheme. And man, it's got me feeling some type of way. Um, Vincey V coming out with these kick-ass schemes, as he always does. Um, if they give me a good tier dead codex to boot, I I have a feeling I will paint up 2,000 points of bugs in that scheme in no time. However, we don't know what order the codexers are coming, so we might I might have to wait another eight months or more to get that codex. But It'll come eventually. Yeah, that's kind of how I sit with World Eaters and Tau. We're almost like, I'm waiting for the Codex to change. <laughs> yeah. Well, which I mean, leads we've... us into today's topic, like, which is how to adjust to a new edition, especially when like you're waiting for an army book, when you're, you're waiting to, to be able to play a new edition with new rules, and other people have their new rules. Yeah, and I also think this doesn't just apply to like an addition change, but also if your army gets overhauled in a codex. That's a great point, John. Um, yeah. If like your it's... army gets totally flipped on its head and rewritten, this is going to apply to you also. Because you are yeah. essentially playing a new army now. You don't know it, but you are. Yeah, like, like we'll, we'll use Death Guard as an example. Death Guard completely, like, they're still the same flavor, but the play style has changed. The way you build an army, the way you, like, look at what units to bring has changed entirely. Yeah, um, I mean, uh... Dark uh, Angels are the same way. Yeah, the buddy I was playing against, Jake, um, he was playing his Death Guard, and it was a whole new army for him. I mean, even, like, their fundamental rule, disgustingly resilient, got overhauled. So, like... Nothing from the old book remains the same except for plague weapons reroll ones to wound. That's it. Everything else is new. And trying to sift through that is part of what inspired this episode. Just because yeah. there are, there's some difficulty in that. Um, but I think as we liked to, before we necessarily dive into why it's hard, we should probably mention for folks what a new edition means or why we get new editions. Um, because I know 8th edition brought a no lot of new hobbyists to the game, and same thing with like Age of Sigmar 2nd edition, brought a ton of new hobbyists to the game who maybe haven't played a tabletop war game before, and this is your first one. And maybe you aren't really so sure like why we even get new editions, how significant the changes are between them, how often they those come out, and... Or maybe you are just now experiencing a edition change for the first time. So for those people, it's probably worth talking about, like, John, what exactly is a new edition? So a new edition of the game comes in essentially two flavors. Um, some, like, kind of three if you want to count the shift from Warhammer Fantasy to Age of Sigmar. Uh, but the two major flavors are a complete overhaul of the system, like a, re a rewriting of the system, mm -hmm. or an adjustment of the system. So, like, from 6th edition to 7th edition, it was an adjustment, just like from 8th edition to 9th edition. But from 7th edition to 8th edition, the game drastically changed to the degree it was pretty much an entirely new game. Yeah, they, they threw everything out and built from the ground up again. Yeah, and, and the big differences between the two of them is that with 9th edition, they had a really solid core with 8th edition, and they just wanted to build upon it and fix some of the issues. Uh, 8th edition was a bit too streamlined, so they just added a little bit more complexity and fixed some of the problems that were getting exploited. Same thing with 6th edition into 7th edition. But the reason why 7th edition went into 8th edition and completely changed was because 7th edition was a very difficult game for new people to play. Like, at, at a competitive level, or at, like at a higher play level... If you played enough games and you, you did enough of the work beforehand to, to know what you're doing, the game felt very good. But it took like months of practice and it took hours of reading rules to get to there. And that's just not good for a consumer product. Um, and I think that most people want to just sit down and play a game and be able to learn the rules within like a game and not have to play a game for months to get it. 
So they changed from 7th to 8th into a more streamlined, simpler to understand, but harder to master game. Yeah. And that seems to be, whenever like the ethos of what a corporate entity wants to do changes, that's when they change like additions entirely. Yeah, that's when they'll overhaul it. When they see something that is so fundamentally different than their current goals that they cannot repair it. You know, you can't just, like, fix the car up. you got to just sell it and buy a new one. Yeah, yeah. And then when you have something from, like, Warhammer Fantasy to Age of Sigmar, where they changed the setting, too, that was because, like, old Warhammer Fantasy wasn't as popular as it is now. Like, when, when they changed Age of Sigmar, it was so unpopular, there were, like, individual products on GW's website that were selling more than the entirety of the Warhammer Fantasy range. Like, the... It, it wasn't until like Total Warhammer came out and people started getting the Age of Sigmar and goes, well, what is this originally from? That people started liking it again. That's why you're seeing old Warhammer come back, like old world become a thing in a few years, according to GW. It it they needed a change to get people to still be interested in their fantasy line. Yep, so they tossed everything out the door. And I'm glad that Sigmar's kind of it's it's nothing really like fantasy. Like it's got characters and, and inspiration from fantasy, but it's become a game that's completely different. Like it, it's nowhere near the same. Yeah, I agree there. Um, although now in Age of Sigmar, obviously we've had two editions, but honestly, like the jump from first edition to second edition wasn't so bad. Uh, it was one of those minor change edition ed jumps. Um, but. Even those can be kind of rough. However, there wasn't a ton of time between, like, 1st edition and 2nd edition. And I think that brings up the topic of how long generally does it take before we get a new edition. And for people out there who have played for a while, I'm sure you are, like, having an aneurysm trying to think through this. Because it is not a set schedule. It is not in stone. Um... I'm sure John can speak to it better than I can, because I've only been playing since uh, the original drop of, like, Age of Sigmar's uh, rulebook, the General's Handbook. That's what it is. And in 8th edition. So for my time playing, it seems like we get a new rulebook every three years or so. However, I have been told that that was not always the case. Yeah, like, there was a time in GW's history where... You'd get an addition change sooner than three years, uh, but you'd also get addition change longer than three years, and you'd get army books that would be from like a third edition, a third edition army book when it was released, used in fifth edition, uh, or like a fifth edition army book that was still being used in seventh edition until the end when they released the Necron book. <laughs> like that stuff just kind of happens. Uh, <laughs> they. But they've fixed that. Like, I, you can't really say, like, historically the formula has been this, because since 8th edition, they've kind of actively tried to change their formula, especially with Age of Sigmar releases and 40k releases, where they don't have a new edition without a book, without an army getting a new book. Yeah, they go point. through all of them every time now, which is yeah. a significant change. And I think it's a better change, because a lot of the problems you'd have, like, if you thought there was FAQs and, like, rules problems now, imagine having to use a book that's from a third edition, like, like, third or fifth edition, four editions, like, three or four editions later, and go, what do I, what, this doesn't even exist anymore, like, how do I use this rule? I mean, I don't have to imagine that, because I would never play that game. Like, I just, <laughs> I just wouldn't. I'd walk away. And I think that in the future, we're going to see that, like, rules updates get faster um, with the advent of, like, the digital age. Oh, yeah, yeah. Especially with the idea of their app. Yeah. Ugh. Virtual rules will probably be a great boon in the, like, ramping up of balancing issues getting solved and, like, new rules or, like, fun stuff getting released. But it's... The, the concern is, like, what's going to happen with buying army books? Is that going to no longer be the case? Are we going to have to buy a new book every six months? Because that's not going to sit well with people, so. I mean, I think there are answers there, but maybe that's a whole other podcast. Like, maybe. 
probably yeah. its own particular topic. But needless to say, there's no set time between editions. But you're going to have a couple of years at least before you have to ever go through this. So that's probably pretty good because at least for me, having just played my first game in ninth edition... Man, it is tricky to change editions. <laughs> um, it is one thing to learn a new game that you have like no idea how it used to play or how the rules used to work, but it is a whole other monster to try to learn a new edition for a game that you already have anchored pre existing uh, sorry, preconditioned ideas about. Like, so my buddy Jake and I played our game. And we, we looked through the book to find a, sort of like a battle plan to where to put objectives and stuff. And that was all very easy because it tells you exactly where to set down objectives on the board. Yeah. And, and then we started, like, we deployed, which wasn't too bad. But then yeah, we had it, our first very, turn. Very similar. Yeah, exactly. Nothing changed there. And then we had our first turn. And he went to cast a psychic spell and we had to go, is Deny the Witch the same? <laughs> what's the range on deny the witch now did they change that i'm not sure if they changed that i heard they might have mentioned it on a forum somewhere yeah but it's really just like we we gotta look that up we gotta look that up so like there we were sifted through the book trying to find like what do you still do deny the witch phase in like the psychic phase what's the range on it and then in particular like is it the same range as it is in age of sigmar no no it's a different range than age of sigmar Okay, okay, how many unbinds do I get? Like, it's yeah. tricky. It was yeah. tricky. Not to um, mention the new terrain rules and everything else. Yes, which are nothing like the old ones. And the same thing, like, he wanted to move up to get on an objective. Of course you do. And then we had to go, how, what, like, what size is the objectives in 40k? And of course I'm like, I don't know, like, six inches in Age of Sigmar, but of course, that's the pre-existing notion that doesn't mean it's correlated here. It's a new edition. They've rewritten everything. On a whole new different game, too, Joe. <laughs> it is, it, but like, they're both Games Workshop IPs, and both of these games are just similar enough that they overlap in your head. Oh, yeah, for sure. There's a whole bunch of overlap there. So, like, when, especially in a new edition, when these things aren't working in harmony, it's discordant, and it is difficult. So then, again, same thing. Like, well, like, is it six inches? I thought I saw in a battle report it might be three inches now. Ah, uh, to the book. And there we were, looking it up again, because we just did not know. Um, and that's, man, that is rough. Because I, I think it's one of the things I took for granted for a long time, is just how much you subconsciously memorize as you play this game. Or any war game. You know, as you play it, you kind of internally remember a rhythm for the phases. You know, yeah, okay. and that's just talking about, like, the base rules of the edition. Like, you're lucky in that you were playing Salamanders and Space Marines. And you kind of got a, a ninth edition book and 8th edition, and then you got, like, the full thing in ninth. Like, it, it all became kind of rote in a small, like, grinding way like there's not a lot of change for the space marines in ninth edition whereas like death guard and like you're seeing now with like uh what's the other one dark angels and i'm assuming the jakari codex is going to be way different there's a whole, it's, it's learning like an entire new way of playing these armies in some ways they haven't changed in editions like dark elder played the basically the same way they have since sixth edition mm -hmm. <laughs> like they just find new tricks but i feel like that's going to be completely different and yeah. when you layer that on top of the base rules, like the core rules, it can lead to a lot of confusion. It is. Um, you know, especially for Jake, like, he played Death Guard through almost all of Eighth. Like, he loved that army. That's probably his favorite 40k army. So he really learned them down to the nitty gritty. So, like, he went to move and do his shots, and he's like, oh, we still have inexorable advance. However, that rule changed slightly. And it, I think that's the difficulty is that it changes slightly and those slight changes will get you and they will get you over and over um and same thing for like weapons profiles changed across the board like every weapon profile that i did not realize i memorized 
now is garbage. They all have to leave. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> I had aggressors with like power fists, and I almost instinctively were just like, yeah, times two strength, a D3 damage. Wait, wait. No, I gotta they look changed. that up. <laughs> Like, I I have to look that up, actually. And I was wrong. I was so wrong. Um, and that's that was the theme of the game. One of us would go, oh, yeah, this is how this works. Wait a minute. And then realize we're vastly incorrect. And because this is our first big addition change that we both experienced, um, you know, it made for a slow game. We'll put it that way. However, I did end up finding some ways to sort of uh, combat that, or at least how we did it in the moment, you know? Because I feel like I, there's got to be other people who experience this problem, which means there's got to be ways that we could try to preempt the issue. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, I have lots of strategies to, to combat starting a new edition or even learning a new game, because a lot of this can be used for learning a new game as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I'll read the book, make notes on a no like on note cards or like a, pay like a piece of paper of where I know I'll get tripped up. Like what I know is going to be things that I don't like. I'm not going to remember. Like I'm not going to remember if power fists are now two damage. I'm going to need to like put a little note for myself. Even if it's go check power fists. <laughs> like don't just <laughs> don't just assume you know everything. <laughs> <laughs> or, unless you're fighting Death Guard, in which case Power Fists deal one damage. Well, that's their rules and how they interact with you. That's different. But Ugh. like doing that, I will like will watch stuff while painting or listen to stuff while working about like the biggest changes other people have found so that I can remember them. And then like the final thing I do is I pick somebody to play a couple of games with that really knows how to play the game with me uh like the best way to put that is like i'm not gonna go play a new person i'm not gonna go play somebody who like we have a somewhat more difficult game playing i'll mm -hmm. play with somebody that I, I, I play with very often so like joe for instance i'll go play him for the new edition so we can talk about the new rules and figure it out and and really get to know each other or like uh seth the guy who edits our podcast there you go, Seth. We've 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 should there we've we go. Showed you. Seth has there mentioned go. that right. we refer to him as both the editor and our buddy Seth because he is our buddy and our editor. Yeah. Uh, so shout out to Seth. He does all the the real hard work. Uh, he takes all of our <laughs> awful breathing sounds out. You're all very welcome. <laughs> uh, like I like historically, like when we went from sixth edition to seventh edition, I played with Seth. When we went from seventh to eighth. I remember me and Seth sitting in our apartment at the time playing for an entire weekend back and forth with like four rule books open at all times, like with like coffee running in the background as we're like, okay, so this has changed. Yeah, that's changed. Yeah. Like, let's figure it out. So we would, we would just sit there and discuss all the rules while playing and we'd get like a game done in like six hours because we are just going over all the new rules and how everything's changed. Uh, because when we switched from 7th to 8th, ooh, buddy. Like, we went from having charts for everything <laughs> and, like, ha like, ha like individual armies didn't have psychic powers all the time. There were, like, core psychic powers everyone could take from. Like, there's so much. There's so much going yeah. on. Yeah, although I think you do, you touched on uh, one of my pieces of advice or how we dealt with it. Uh, you mentioned that, like, your games took forever, like six hours. I think that's one of your best strategies is to slow it down oh, when yeah. learning a new system or like a, a new edition. You just got to slow down. Everything that you used to do quickly on sort of memorization, you can't trust it. You just can't. You don't know how much of that has changed. Even if it's not in a, a large sort of radical way, small changes still matter oftentimes in games like this that are kind of granular. And then in that case, you've got to slow down and look up everything. And I mean everything. You can't even assume that, like, the phases of the game are the same or in the same order. Absolutely yeah. everything. Just go to the book and look it up as your turn goes on. Make like little tabs for yourself in the rule book if you feel comfortable doing that for, like, where you go with, like, little bookmarks. Like, where you think it's going to be important. 
It's yeah. like whenever I'm playing the game and it's a new edition, I will keep a rule book, like a physical rule book, open on the table at all times, like with the, with the rules kind of bookmarked, like past the fluff, so that people know like these are the rules and we'll look it up and everybody can just look it up between games. There's times where even I've had a third person sit and will like read rules to explain it, like a third person to like help with a a weird like council of Nike weirdos like all going oh this is how shooting works in our plastic army man game <laughs> you laugh but that is our buddy bees like when jake and i play that's our buddy bees he's yeah you know in addition to making skynet that would kill us all he's got a brain for rules that i i just cannot get close to and it is helpful to have him nearby a table so if jake and i and our normal squishy human brains can't quite handle it we could pass the book to him and have him run it through his cloud computing system in his head. Does and the anime push up the glasses thing? <laughs> just <laughs> yes, and then just unceremoniously spit back to us how it actually works. Yeah. It's helpful. I mean, it is very helpful. Like it, it does help, and also because when you are playing a game, there is always like a little bit of that notion of like, well, this is how I think it should work. That doesn't necessarily mean that's how that works. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And who knows what the intentions are of the designers, and that's a tricky game to get into. So if you could have somebody who could kind of suss it out in between, like, the rules as written, invaluable when learning a new system. Absolutely invaluable. Although, yeah. I think I do kind of differ from John here. So, like... John mentioned that he like he reads the rule book heavily before he plays and like makes little cards or like reminder sheets or you know little guides for his section of the game and uh that's all very cool but I can't do that like that's that's not how my brain learns things just isn't never has been um even when I was getting my degrees in the school like the book learning just never was my forte. Um, I have to, I am a kinesthetic learner. Like I have to actually just do the thing for me to internalize any of it. And I think for other people like me, you'll probably find that you've been that way your whole life. And for people who have had that experience, there's no substitution. Much like if you're trying to learn how to work on a car, you're trying to learn how to fish, you're trying to learn how to shoot a bow and arrow, like, you just have to go out and do it. And the it's the same here. Um, get yourself a partner, sit down with the rule book, assume that nothing is the same, and just hammer out a couple of games. So that way you can make new neural pathways in your brain to memorize the new stuff. Yeah. Because... And we can talk about it in like a future episode about how like this this is not something specifically for this topic. Like in the hobby, there's a lot of like temptation to just go, I'm gonna watch forty hours of how to do wet blending on YouTube and then you sit down to do wet blending and you go, I actually have no idea how to wet blend. Yep. Because you haven't physically even tried to do it. You like, don't have their muscle memory there even to kind of get your hands to do what you want yeah it's it's a multi-level like learning uh scheme you gotta like for me i have to trick my brain into staying interested <laughs> <laughs> like i will know that i'm interested but my attention span is that of a, of a squirrel and so i'll like read note go back to reading while listening to like one of those like lo-fi channels or whatever mm -hmm. and then I'll go watch video because I'll invariably I will get distracted from reading the rule book, but I'll still want to do something involving the new edition. So I'll go watch a video <laughs> on it <laughs> and then I'll go back to it and I'll do notes and I'll do that back and forth and I'll go to a game and I'll have like little tidbits of information that I've remembered. And then, and then I'll sit down with like my little note cards and be like, Hey, me and my dumb brain figured out some stuff. What do you think of this as we're like playing a game? Like, it's just I'm a little goblin creature when it comes to like how I do stuff. It's very dumb. Like <laughs> I mean, 
If it works for you, though, it ain't wrong. And I think yeah. that's kind of the important point here. Like, we educational sort of scholars can tell you that folks learn in different ways. Like, that that's no secret. Everybody knows this. That there are a multitude of different teaching strategies which are not always as effective on two or three different people. Everybody learns differently. You've got brains that are sort of predisposed to different strategies of learning. And that's true in school, and it's true here. You know, any it's true everywhere you're trying to pick up new knowledge or a new skill. And that means that there's no one right answer on how to weather this thing. But rather, whatever way gets the job done for you, it's great. I, I endorse it. Yeah, we're here to give you, like, suggestions, not to tell you how it is empirically. At the end of the day, you know you better than we know you. We're just kind of giving ideas, and trying to help get your gears turning on that notion, I suppose. Yeah, and I think also another important part is to kind of mention how to get those tools and that idea for yourself. And, you know, if none of our suggestions work for you, I'll say this. Look back on your sort of uh, educational career, whatever that was, middle school, high school, college, wherever you kind of hopped off that boat. How did you learn best then? Just kind of take a moment to think about it. You know, what worked for you in those moments when you were trying to learn a new topic that might not be so inherently crystal clear? Yeah. Whatever worked then is going to work now. Or even if it's not like school related and you want to use something like maybe you learned how to cook when you were like 24 because you started going to the gym and you decided that you needed to like make your own food instead of eating frozen stuff all the time. What did you do to do that? Like, did you look up stuff and then, like, practice and then look up more stuff? Or did you have to, like, figure out all of it before you even touched a pan? Or did you watch, like, YouTube videos? Yeah. Like, did, what did, did you, you read do? cookbooks? Did you read blogs? Like, which of those mediums worked for you? Because we are pretty fortunate that the hobby is growing right now. So whatever medium worked for you then, it exists. There are a ton of hobby blogs. There are beautiful youtube channels galore to explain it to you in a variety of different ways there's podcasts i mean hell y'all are listening to one now um, there's reddit there's people on instagram like there's facebook there's groups live streams like the there is not i like I, I genuinely think there's not any point in time in which you cannot find something new about warhammer on the internet at any point um and that was not the case for, like for a like way back when like I remember having, like, very little Warhammer content on the internet. Uh, I remember there was, like, two YouTube channels. That was it. <laughs> like, I'm an old man. I'm just out here ho hollering about the old days. The kids these days and their Warhammers and their Gobbledygooks and their Yarlopter. They're... Two plus tufts and their boulder morts. <laughs> What's a boulder mort? Is that a what the hell's thing? a boulder mort? <laughs> 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 yeah, um, I mean, it. We have spruced other content creators before, but like in terms of learning rules, especially, find someone who works for you and then use it. Like, that's. I think that's the golden piece of advice I could give you here. And every time there's a new edition, uh, there's always a, a deluge of 40k content creators or Age of Sigmar content creators that will go over in detail the new edition. And they're not going to get everything, but they're going to get the big, big things. And then playing will help you find the small things. Yeah, practice, practice, practice. There's no substitute for it. But for some people, like me, it is the main goal. And... I think that's I think that's probably the best place to leave it cuz I feel like we could go on for a while and drill down but we could go I've, on forever about anything, Joe. That's I mean, that's why we're <laughs> professional podcasters. We're not professional podcasters. We're professional bullshitters. There's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> we could sit and just jabber jaw about generally anything for hours at a time. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like I don't know. When you get too far into the weeds on something, you get totally lost and you lose a lot of the value that you were driving for. And I, I want to avoid that here. 
Well, so yeah, in this case, absolutely. this is where I think it's best to kind of pass it off to y'all out there listening in viewer land. If you're listening to this, uh, just because I'm kind of interested, and I genuinely want to know if this is as difficult for other people as it is for me. Uh, reach out to us on the social medias. Um, or if you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment. Uh, do you guys have a problem similar to this? Do you guys struggle as much as I seem to struggle <laughs> in learning a new edition? Or is it maybe something that's more of a me problem combined with having not played in a year? Very possible. Um, I would love to hear about it. I just... It is hard to be in other people's heads, cause, and that's a dangerous game. So I would rather just kind of put it out there and ask. And if you've um, got tips or tricks that we haven't talked about, go ahead and slap them on as a comment, or email us with them, or send us in their DMs. Slide in our DMs with your uh, sweet rules hit tips. Like, whatever <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, you know, add yeah. us at Twitter, or however the kids say it nowadays. Actually, no, you just reminded me. I got a bone to pick with you, Jonathan. Uh, yeah. Do not follow the Twitter. John has posted the meme where my lady stitched together a picture of me in college with the new, uh, what is it? The, the emo Shrike marines. Model. Yeah, the Raven Guard Cameron Shrike model. Yeah, and I don't think we mentioned it at the podcast, but John shared that picture out. He just tweeted it out to the world. Yeah. Ugh. You told me I could on the podcast, bro. I know, but then I saw it was out there on the internet, and I went, ah! But... <laughs> <laughs> so I, I steer you away from Twitter. Do not go to the Twitter. Head to the Instagram. It's way cooler. You I run that one. You have to go look at your stupid face. <laughs> I don't even look like I'm unrecognizable now. <laughs> it's true. It's true. We have grown up a lot since being 14. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you do want that picture, it is on the Twitters, and we would love to hear from y'all, as always. But I think that's going to be it for now. And that's been all of our opinions. Bonafide Kentucky Fried. We'll see y'all next time.